Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. And this podcast is about how I became the very best at being humble and <laughs> in the world. Me and my brother-in-law have joked about that for a long time. Uh, writing a book, Humility, and how I'm the best at it. <laughs> this is not a podcast about how awesome I am at being humble. This is not... <laughs> what does I've talked about humility on and off in different podcasts and different Bible studies. I was reading an article in the New York Times and by uh, Benedict Carey, and he talks about how humility has have been it's been on the rise, you might say, in psychology. Uh, therapists have been writing more research on the notion of humility, and I thought there was interesting things that was said, but also as it relates to the New Testament, they define humility as as characterized by an ability to accurately acknowledge one's limitations and abilities. So that's the first thing, is the ability to accurately acknowledge one's limitations and abilities, the fact that you're limited, to, and an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented rather than self-focused. And that's uh, kind of sort of a close biblical term, a definition. I'll talk about that in a second. He goes on to say that a lot of research is coming out now of how humility and psychology go together particularly as it relates to positive psychology, and that's a long story, but that, that's uh, back in the kind of 1990s, which eventually gave rise to life coaching, a kind of form of positive psychology, a psychology that talks about how to increase your quality of life, and it's a kind of solutions-based therapy where you go through therapy in the assumption that you can make things better. That might sound a little crazy to you, but it's not in psychology. Not all psychology is trying to come to a goal or oriented approach where you might say, I want to stop doing blank and here's how to stop doing blank, but rather how to process things over time and so forth. Well, positive psychology is kind of like that where it's trying to have a overall outlook on life. And that's why life coaching spin, how do I say it, spun out of that. And it's interesting how uh, the understanding of humility has increased. Another thing that's very similar and interesting to me that has uh, arisen the last couple of decades in therapy work, if you don't know this, and that is the, the role of forgiveness. For a long time, forgiveness and certainly not humility were not considered primary things to go to. In fact, today, there are many psychologists who don't talk about forgiveness. Uh, they don't want it's on purpose. They'll say, no, that's not what I bring up for various reasons. Sometimes people don't do it because I think it sounds too religious. And if you are a a well-trained uh, therapist in general, I say well-trained, I mean that in general, <laughs> uh, you're taught you never, ever, ever are supposed to put, uh, place your values on the person with whom you were speaking. And it's very important. You're not there to, to violate their values and so forth. You're just not there to do that. And so forgiveness is, sounds religious to some people, and sometimes it sounds like, well, anyway, they have the reasons for it. But forgiveness and humility are on the rise. They're on the rise, and in fact, people who are humble, that they've come out, they, the research is demonstrating the people who are humble are more positive. They have uh, better uh, relationships. They are less aggressive, less judgmental uh, toward other people. And this last uh, paragraph I was going to read for you, uh, well, maybe the last couple, he says, now that humility is attracting some research attention, Van Tongeren, he's the person interviewed, there, they said there are a number of open questions, including whether it can somehow be taught or perhaps integrated into psychotherapy. And that's a different thing. Quote, one of the thorny issues is that the people who are the most open and willing to cultivate humility might be the ones who need it the least. And vice versa, those most in need could be the most resistant. Uh, end quote. And that's exactly right. I mean, that's, we know that in common sense life, but also in therapy, people have counseled through the years. You can usually meet people very quickly and tell they need to work on the humility because you can tell they're arrogant or they're prideful, you know, they're condescending, they're a critical parent. And when it comes to therapy work, that's some of the most difficult, difficult people with whom to deal because they oftentimes need to work on themselves. And that's the very thing they're unable to do, which is admit they're wrong. And especially when people have a real problem with this, they're called narcissists. Narcissists seem they have little to no capacity to admit wrong and to work on things that are wrong. And they're almost impenetrable to psychotherapy or any kind of therapy work <laughs> because they're just not humble at all. They're not open-minded to being wrong. What's striking about that is that with forgiveness as well and counseling, and you'll if you talk to therapists, uh, particularly Christian therapists, they'll tell you in the technical sense, they're going to say, duh, 
but <laughs> they've been talking about it for a long time because that's in the biblical worldview. A lot of people, I think, in my experience of working in churches for a long time, don't know what the terms mean or why they're important. If I were coming at this from a purely secular perspective, usually most most of the time in secular perspective, you have to come at it uh, of the why it's important to do X from what's called egoism. Egoism, egotistical, is the same base of the word. That is to say, it's good for you to do it because it's good for you. It somehow benefits you. And whenever you hear someone say, you really ought to work really hard because your your paycheck will increase. In other words, you need to do that X because of Y. And X is good, and the Y is always good for you. That's egoism. Well, that's a kind of ethical system. Uh, most Christians who've ever thought about this subject would say that is not a Christian way to think about it, but that's my point. If I were not a Christian, a pagan, I would say it's it's good to be humble because... Or it's good to forgive because it helps you. Now, as a Christian, I'm not against doing things that, that help me. <laughs> it's, it's okay to do things that help yourself. It's just that ideally, that's not why we do things that are virtuous or moral or good. We do them because, uh, well, there's two other reasons you might say. One is a few, but one, and I have a whole series on this on ethics. You ought to listen to it on my podcast, uh, but also I think it's on my YouTube channel on morality. If you if you want to think about morality, I do my best to explain that and I three or four uh, lessons. Anyway, there are different reasons to do it. And I and many others argue that the number one reason why Christians ought to do anything virtuous is because it's like Jesus. It's forming the character of Jesus inside of us. And so we call that virtue ethics, that we're forming the character of Jesus inside of us. Okay. Having said that, that's one thing is a, in a pagan, non-Christian way, you might get it that way. From a Christian perspective, it's very different. You might not know this, but humility is a Christian virtue, and I, <laughs> I hope you do know that. But if not, that's okay. Uh, humility, however, is a very bizarre virtue. And the reason why it's so bizarre is because it goes against the grain of nearly all people groups, particularly in the West. Now, in Asian cultures and African cultures and so forth, forth I don't know a minimal amount. There, it's a little different, and I can't say much about that because it's not my specialty. But I can speak a lot more about the Greeks and the Romans, you might say Greco-Roman society. And certainly, and then, of course, Jewish, then early Jewish and Christian. The Greeks and Romans, uh, of course, the, the primary milieu or, or social environment of the earliest Jews and Christians, uh, they did not believe humility was a virtue at all. Uh, we get the word humility from humilitas, from Latin. You know, humus for Latin means earth or dirt. And oftentimes, if you go and get uh, fertilizer at the store and you buy it, it'll say, uh, it looks like hummus, hummus. Yeah, I don't, hummus is different. Uh, hummus, the food, is not dirt. But anyway, the, the origin of that word <laughs> is dirt. So humilitas means of the dirt. Uh, you know, uh, typonos in Greek is different. Uh, a different term, of course, in Greek. But it means the same kind of thing. But it was not a virtue. And so of the earth means something like debased, lowered, crushed. Uh, it was associated with shame. Uh, typically, if you lost at something, you lost at battle, you lost at this war. If you lost in some kind of public discourse or a debate, you were shamed. And so that word was associated with with being defeated. If you were in athletics and you got defeated, you might be humiliated. Well, to this day in American English, we still use it in often ways the same way. That's what's accurate. Humiliated means to demonstrate that you're worse than. To demonstrate, to be, to demonstrate perhaps shame on the person. The problem is the term humble or humility, or some people might say humble, humble, like uh, my father-in-law says humble, uh, <laughs> but he doesn't say humility. Humility only says humble. Anyway, I don't care how you can say how you want because the aspiration uh, there's different. You can say if you want to or not. What ebbs. But in any case, uh, humility, humility was not a virtue in the Greco-Roman world. What it wasn't because it's associated with shame and loss. What was uh, very much considered a virtue was something different called philotimia. Philo means a love of, and then timio or from timi, honor, the love of honor. And uh, Greeks and Roman philosophers, when they wrote about this, in general, they did not have a problem with people being very proud. No, well, I need to say it more forcefully than that. They they were convinced it was good to be praised on what was appropriate, particularly when you were the winner or when you were awesome, <laughs> when you deserve the honor. They did not like it. They did not praise people when they bragged about themselves without cause. 
So self-love, just going around thinking, you know, I'm the man, I'm the man, you might say for no reason, that was not a positive thing. What was a positive thing was when you achieve something great, you should get the respect you deserve. Now, the and that's philotemia, that's very different. That's very different. And we know this occurred all over the place in the Greco-Roman world because it's it's implied and manifested in inscriptions, uh, both Greeks, Romans, and Jews. People just in general had no problem doing what we would call bragging. Bragging was in. Bragging was a virtue. So instead of saying philotemia, you might not know those Greek words, that's fine, we'll say bragging. But you needed to brag about something you really accomplished. And it was assumed that not only can you brag... The really, really important people have people brag for them. And so when you had a client-patron relationship of people who are beneath you, who might work for you, maybe you gave them money, a handout, a job. They were supposed to show up early in the morning and sing praises about you and tell the people, here comes the great David. He is the most magnanimous a ruler, selfless, that and he has accomplishments. So you're supposed to be bragged about, and you can brag about yourself, your own accomplishments. That was the way you did it. Everyone did it that way. I mean, you're supposed to. When you read these inscriptions, it's amazing how much they brag about themselves. It's, it, it is. Um, and that's, again, one more time, it's different from being modest, modestia, that's in Latin. Uh, that was like when you're restrained and this dignified. You, 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 we might say in America, we say, I bit my lip or I closed my mouth. That is, I could have said something, I could have done something, but I didn't. That's a good thing. Humilitas was different. Humilitas is when you're shameful. Oftentimes, humility is associated with a slave. Humility is the state of a slave because you are in an abased, lowered uh, position socially. Socially, you are beneath them and you will have, well, I mean, your property. So in that sense, you can never, ever be at the level of someone who's a free person, of course. Uh, when you read, not only in Greeks, Greeks and Romans did this, Jews did the same thing. And Josephus does this in his autobiography. Josephus talks about how awesome he was. He he says several things. But in his, his introduction, he says, Brought up with Math- uh, Matthias, my own brother by both parents, I made great progress in my education, gaining a reputation for an excellent memory and understanding. While still a mere boy, about 14 years old, I won universal applause for my love of literature, insomuch that the chief priests and the leading men of the city used constantly to come to me for precise information on some particular uh, issue in our our ordinances and our commandments and our our teaching. And so, I mean, today we would go, why in the world is he starting his autobiography bragging about it? But that's what you did in the ancient world. And if you you know your Bible at all, that sounds a whole lot like whom? Not Jesus, but who's the other character you know? Of course, the Apostle Paul. Paul has no problem bragging about himself. I'm going to pause right there. If you don't mind, please listen carefully to these quick announcements. Ever wonder what God wants you to do with your money? Should I give it all away or save? What did the early church do with their money? In Dr. Pendergrass's book, Give It Away, Reflections on How Christians Use Money, you'll get four short, powerful lessons on what to do with money based on some key texts from the New Testament. This is a wonderful guide for study and reflection. It even comes with reflection questions that are perfect for small group discussions. Give it away. Reflections on how Christians use money. Buy your copies today on Amazon.com. Do you know of any skeptics in your family, at work, or among your friends? Do you struggle with questions concerning the existence of God or the truth claims of Christianity? Has a skeptic ever challenged you with a difficult question concerning your faith? Then you need to buy Dr. Pendergrass's book, A Skeptic Challenges a Christian, on Amazon.com. You can get it in paperback or on Kindle or in audiobook form to listen to. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian is written unlike any other book. It's not boring and full of technical jargon. It reads like you're sitting down having a conversation. As one reviewer said, As a college student, I absolutely love this book. Dr. Pendergrass knows how to effectively answer a lot of the questions that my friends at school ask about my faith. This book is a great resource for theological debates and for my own personal growth. The arguments are clear and understandable. I would definitely recommend this book to anyone who has questions about Christianity, wants to learn how to defend their faith, or even just wants a good read. Great book! Find out why it has a perfect 5-star rating on Amazon.com. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian. Buy your copies today. Do you like receiving a glimpse of the kingdom for free? 
Would you like to support what God is doing through these resources? Then please consider donating to David Pendergrass Ministries, Inc. today at davidpendergrass.com. There, you can also sign up to receive Dr. Pendergrass's free blog on a wide range of theological, biblical, and relationship issues. That's davidpendergrass.com. Okay, let's pick back up where we left off. You remember in Philippians chapter 3? He is talking about people who are probably, we might say, Jewish Christians who were still Judaizers, people who are telling Gentile Christians that you're not really a Christian until you get circumcised. And Paul is going against that idea. And he says, uh, let me go on down to verse four. He says that if someone thinks he has good reasons to put confidence in human credentials, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That means Jews, he's being, that means his parents were faithful Jews is what that means. From the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin's important because King David came from that tribe. A Hebrew of Hebrews. I lived according to the law as a Pharisee. And that, those are the superheroes in the ancient world. In my zeal for God, I persecuted the church. Zealous is good because Phineas before him was zealous and he persecuted the Gentiles. So he says, in my zeal for God, I persecuted the church. According to the righteousness stipulated in the law, I was blameless. Paul, in other places, does similar things. He has no problem bragging about himself because that's exactly what he would be, have been expected to do and what his audience would have expected him to do as well because he's bragging. What's so striking is what he says next in verse 7. But these, these things, these assets, these accomplishments, I've come to regard as liabilities for Christ or worse than that, dung, that, that is, they're, they're just compared to knowing Jesus, and what he says in verse 8, they're, they're cow dung. Well, he uses a different word that probably is, quite frankly, kind of a cuss word in the ancient world. That is, this stuff is not, it's, it just doesn't matter at all. But my point is, they would have expected this kind of humility to occur. Now, Greeks and Romans did have the concept of this kind of humility before the gods of course, of course you were, because the gods could humiliate you, the gods could punish you, the gods could kill you, or even before the emperor. You could take on the disposition above the emperor, because the emperor also could punish you, could kill you, or could bless you, um, in, in that sense. But you did not have the, you did not want, it was just not a virtue, you did not want to be like a slave and have the temperament or the attitude of humility, not toward other people you didn't, ever. What is so striking in the early Jesus movement, and even in Judaism, I mean, let me back up a little bit, in the Old Testament, you don't see a heavy emphasis upon being humble with your fellow Jews. You didn't. Now, we could quote from some Proverbs and some examples, but you, don't, you just don't have an emphasis upon that at all. Where the rubber really meets the road, the reason why humility eventually becomes a virtue, it, quite frankly, and I mean, I don't know how you couldn't argue against this historically, is Jesus. Jesus demonstrates and calls his disciples to be humble. He doesn't always use the term, and that's fine, but he does things that in the ancient world almost certainly would have been considered acts of humility. For example, everyone knows uh, John chapter 13. John 13, Jesus is having a meal with his disciples, might have been Passover meal, might not, whatever, and he takes out the water basin and starts to wash their feet wash their feet, and they freak out. What are you doing here? Jesus would have always been considered the guest of honor at any normal uh, Jewish meal, absolutely, because he would—he was respected as a great teacher, So, which means he sat in the best place, probably, and if they had a anything like a triclinium, any kind of table, almost certainly either in the middle where the food and entertainment was easily accessed or at the ends of it, it depends on the situation, but he would have taken the, the seat of honor. And they would have had servants or slaves, people in the background. And if not have servants or slaves, it would have been the woman's job to do it. What Jesus does is the act of a slave. What he does is a very humble act. And it again, it kind of freaks them out. It says, no, no, don't you dare wash my feet. Like, what are you doing? It's not an issue. Of, it's important because oftentimes, well, frankly, I've heard this preached kind of sort of correctly and oftentimes wrong. It's not that Jesus would just... Not the disciples would have gone, oh, okay, that makes sense. He, he's been a nice guy. It's that he's genuinely performing a role that zero people would have ever wanted him or expected him to fulfill. They would have said, it's just, it's not your job. Jesus, you're really freaking me out now. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. What are you doing? What are you doing? We have servants for that. Or we have women. That's their role. It's not your role to do that. It's just not your role. Uh, for a lot of people... 
imagine someone who's the CEO of the company and they're in their $2,000 suit. Let's say it's a guy and he's got all dressed up and he comes out and he gets his suit and goes and it goes down to the bottom of the ditch and starts cleaning out latrines with poop and urine in there. And he's cleaning it. And they're like, what are you doing down here? We have people to deal with all this. It's humiliating. What are you doing? It just, it would not make sense. And of course, Jesus says, of course, I need to wash your whole body and so forth. He wants them to do the same thing. He's setting an example of humility. Jesus tells parables about exactly what it means to be like this. In Luke Luke chapter 14, uh, notice in Luke chapter 14, verse 7, when Jesus noticed uh, how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. So he's saying he notices and when people come to eat at someone's house, they, t- they can tell right away that they go straight to the seats that demonstrate how honorable they are. Uh, and it's, a, it's like a public demonstration of bragging. And so Jesus tells a parable at some point, whether he saw it right then and told a parable or it doesn't matter. The point is, Luke is saying, Jesus reflecting on that actual behavior, he told a parable. He said, uh, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor because a person more distinguished than you might have been invited by your host. So see, see the assumption is <clears throat> don't assume you're all that. When the host who invited you, well, so the host who invited both of you will come and say, hey, give this man your place. Then ashamed, you'll begin to move to the least important place. Did you hear that? So that's the whole same point. But when you're invited, go and take the least important place so that when your host approaches, he will say to you, friend, move up here to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who share the meal with you. Meal with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, you can interpret this how you want. It's common in New Testament scholarship to say this is not a parable about merely here's what you do when you go to dinner. But rather, probably, as Luke calls it, a parable. That is, it's something that is applies to almost any situation. The point is, in general, you should behave as if everyone else around you is has a higher social ranking than you do. You should assume that. Assume that other people deserve to be bragged on, <laughs> not you. And that's why in verse 11, he probably means... God the Father will exalt. That is, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He probably means at the end of time. Now, we don't know for sure if that's what he meant, but probably so. I find that convincing. I don't think Jesus means every single time you go to someone's house to have dinner, every single time you sit down the bottom of the worst seat, and every single time the host is going to say, you come up here. I mean, that's possible. It is possible. I just don't think so. I think he means... It's like that in life. God the Father will exalt you because you've lived a lifestyle of never being presumptuous. And Luke says back to back another one that's like this, a chapter Luke 14, verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you host a dinner or a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors so you can be invited by them in return and get repaid. But when you host an elaborate meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. It's a very similar thing. These people, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind have nothing to brag about. They have nothing to brag about. There is no concept. (laughs) There's no concept like this in the time period. You just can't even come close to it. What, What kind of person tells his people that what you ought to do is hang out with people who never ever have a chance of being praised who never get a chance to brag they they will not have a large plaque when they die which is what greeks and romans did is the longer the plaque the better i mean augustus did his own it was it's massive we still have it i mean he brags and brags and brags about all of his accomplishments at least what he thinks are accomplishments jesus says yeah invite those people Invite the people who don't have what it takes to invite you back. That is to say, they can't brag on you either. They can't honor you. They can't go to the whole community and say, let me invite David back over dinner. He's the most amazing, giving, magnanimous person there's ever been. He can't, they can't do it. They can't do it. It's just astonishing. And Jesus says a similar kind of idea when he says in Mark 10, 45, of course, the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. 
and give his life as a ransom for many. I'm looking on the list of all the things Jesus talks about. So we have a constant, constant concept that Jesus that he demonstrates that Jesus himself, though he, though in that context of the first century in Galilee and Jerusalem, he had every right to kind of play that card, to be bragged upon and be honored everywhere he went. And he did not, as far as we can tell, he did not. He did not play that card. In fact, what it has told his disciples, don't play that card either. Don't do that. Be a servant of all. Servants. The, the Greek word there just means servant. It's the same Greek word they use for what we would say waiter or waitress. It, it's uh, later on that, that you can use a different word. You can use slave or servant or a specific kind of servant like that. It's also called, de- we get a word deacon, a diaconis, or, uh, diac- or a female version of that. Deacon or deaconess. The point is, these are servants. When you get to the Pauline literature, Paul's letters, and which we alluded to, I alluded to a second ago, we see this not only in Paul's letters, of course, but in the early church in Acts. This became a virtue to be humble, to be like a servant, to be like a slave. Again, I can't stress how bizarre this was in the ancient world. Epictetus, who was an author at the, about the same time period, he called slaves irrational animals. And runaway slaves, he called worse. He called them a cowardly, rational, irrational animals. So these are not the kind of people you want to be like. You don't want to be like the slaves. You don't want to be them. <laughs> and Jesus says, yeah, you do. That's what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's, it's part of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Let me put this with brass tacks on it. It means, in reality, the way that God, God designed interrelationships is that we express our love in humility. We express our love in humble ways. We're supposed to love our neighbor, right, as ourself, and love our enemy, and pray for those who persecute us. And and one of the chief ways we will know we're demonstrating love is we're doing it as an abased, humble person. <laughs> I've heard C.S. Lewis's quote very often. And he's he's on the right track. Lewis just wasn't a biblicist. He says, well, humility is not thinking worse of yourself, less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Thinking of yourself less. That is, you don't think about yourself all the time. So suppose that like, goes back to Lewis. I think that's a, I mean, I've heard that attributed to Lewis. I think it is, maybe not. But the point is, it is something like that. I know in mere Christianity, he talks about humility. Well, that's, yeah, in that sense, it's not thinking about your, I would, I'd be more specific and nuanced as I have in this podcast. I would say, well, yeah, Lewis, you're onto something. It's not just not thinking of yourself. It's not, it rather, it's not taking the opportunity to brag about yourself, to talk about your own accomplishments. Ever, 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 ever. Does it, David, does that mean a Christian a Christian can never talk about an accomplishment? I don't think that's true. I don't think it's Christians can never talk about an accomplishment. I would say only if and only if it's apropos to the conversation. Ever. If it's completely appropriate to the conversation. Maybe someone asks you about something you've did you ever were you ever a star singer? <laughs> I don't <laughs> did you ever win a championship on the hockey team? Well then okay, you can tell them, yes, I did. Were you ever a great student. I sure was. It's just that Christians should do everything they can to stop talking about themselves and their accomplishments. They should. They should knock it off. Christians should, should have no business in the bragging game, in the bragging competition. If you find yourself finding that difficult, uh, if you find yourself being the kind of person who talks about your accomplishments, and I know many people, I know several Christians who are this way, and certainly a lot of non-Christians this way. If you find yourself uh, just almost have compulsively talking about your resume and how awesome you are and what you've done and what you've done and what you've done, uh, it could mean you're a narcissist. It could mean that. And you, I hope and pray that you will at least Google that. And if you find yourself not open-minded to that possibility, then you probably are a narcissist. Really, I mean, if you're like forgetting David's crazy, out. Of course, I'm not. Well, then you you very well could be. Narcissist will almost certainly assume they're not. A a non narcissist, someone who might be close to that, they're, they're teeter tottering on that side. They're getting close. You might at least Google it, read it, and say, "Do I do this?" And if you really want to know, ask someone who knows you well and say, "Please tell me the truth." But if you're really gut level honest, you'll know whether or not you're the person who likes to talk about your accomplishments all the time. 
Do you bring out the trophies? Do you bring out your resume? Do you bring out the plaques? Do you bring out stories? Does every story talk about how awesome you are or what you've accomplished? Now think about that for a second. Uh, Christians can do this about how many baptisms they've done. Christians can do this about how awesome their Bible studies are, about how awesome their sermons are, about how awesome their prayer life is, how awesome the whatever. And it's not talking about just, again, if it's appropriate in the conversation, it's just if you find yourself compelled oftentimes internally, like I just feel like I've got to tell that person in front of me how what I did was successful. You're not being humble and you might be a narcissist. The other option is, and this is more common. What's more common is you have a low self-esteem. That is, you have a low sense of your own value and you are desperately starving on the inside for validation. A lot of people who are that way grew up in households where either they were praised only when things were phenomenal, excellent, or they were raised in homes where they didn't receive much validation at all. And so basically everyone in front of them becomes a mama or daddy. They have mama or daddy issues, really, quite frankly, let's make it quite simple. That's what it is. And so they brag about themselves so that the person in front of them might go, wow, that's amazing. Wow. Whoa, you're incredible. And then for those, that brief few seconds, maybe for a minute or so, they go, I am something. I am a somebody. I do matter. Someone recognize what I did. Well, again, more often than not, it's a low self-esteem. So you, if you find yourself tempted to brag about yourself all the time, figure it out. If you're man or woman enough, <laughs> but quite frankly, if you're Christian, just, just figure it out. Just say, all right, am I a narcissist or is it something else? Or maybe there's another third, fourth option. But in my experience, those are the two big, most uh, common options that a person suffers from if they find a compulsion. In non-Christian world, it's very common. You'll know this. It's a very easy way to stand out at work, maybe even at home, is, is to be the person who just praises other people. Just be the person who never has to brag about how awesome you are, ever. Whatever you do successful, nope. In America, we have an expression called toot your, tooting your horn. It means bragging about yourself, praising yourself. Don't ever toot your own horn is the expression. Let others toot it if they're going to do that. If everyone's going to brag about you, let someone else do it. Great. Great. And if someone does brag about you, if someone says, thank you, you did an excellent job, you were great, don't go, no, 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 no. It's okay to receive praise. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Really, thank you very much. It's very kind. And that's enough. You don't <laughs> say more. Say more. You're right on to something. I mean, <laughs> just thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. I worked hard. And that's over. That's good. Don't you want the applause of God? I mean, if you're a Christian gut level, don't you want Jesus to be proud of you? I think so. Jesus is proud of you when you're humble. Jesus isn't just proud of you when you're successful. I'm sure he is proud of those. I really do. I think, I think Jesus is very pleased with us when we work hard for the kingdom and we're successful. I think he's glad about that. He's also very proud of us when we're not bragging about himself, ourselves. So, don't. <laughs> so, let's be humble. And if someone thinks they have self-honor and self-love and they've got to be praised all the time, that's an easy way to be different at work. Just be the one who doesn't brag ever. Uh, praise other people, but don't be braggadocious. And that's it. That's all I got to do. That's, that's pretty simple. <laughs> it sounds easy, doesn't it? And uh, we'll try and work on that together. And that's exactly how I'm the most humble person in the world. I love, <laughs> I love C.S. Lewis. He ends this chapter on pride. He says, if you... Uh, if you think you're not prideful, you're very prideful indeed, or something like that. You're very prideful. The point is, really, humble people realize that they struggle sometimes with wanting to brag. Okay, well, we admit that, and we close our mouths. That's it. Doesn't mean you're going to hell by it. Just as Christians, we say, Lord Jesus, I want to be like you. No matter when I might deserve to be bragged upon, no matter when I might deserve to be in a place of honor in this conversation, or this group, or this club, or my family, or peers... I'm not going to take the opportunity to be honored. I'm not going to make sure everyone or even the one person in front of me, I'm not going to take the opportunity to make sure they know what I've accomplished and how great I've done. I just want you to be proud of me because I want to do what I do for you, not for the applause of men or women. Let's try that together. I'll pray with you. Whew. Well, the conversation isn't finished. You can always reach out to me on social media. Are you on Facebook? 
I am too. At Glimpse of the Kingdom. Glimpse of the Kingdom on Facebook. Be sure to like it and you can see updates there. Also, if you're on Twitter, check me out at at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass, or at Glimpse the King, at Glimpse the King, and I try my best to respond to comments and questions on there as quickly as I can. If you want more, there are many more resources on the podcast and my blog. Go to my website, davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com, and you can see a full list of the podcast, and my blog is available for free. Are you active in a church right now? I'd be happy to come out to your church and do all kinds of classes and workshops there. Check out davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com for more information. And may God in his great grace give you even just a glimpse of his kingdom this week. See you next time.